Tired of the waves that come and knock you off your feet I long to see you on a day when you won't drown The constant dragging and deceit Your hands been tied and there to greet A life that's bound to a world That keeps on taking you Be you tired of the strains, the lonely highs, the constant rains that seep right through you on the days you're coming down? You be relying on horizons where the skies will fill with diamonds, ain't surprising that the love that you have lost is in your mind. Where we go, we'll take the highs and lows with us one. Be you tired of the waves that come and knock you off your feet I'd long to see you on a day when you won't drown Maybe the answer lies beneath these scattered words They flood our streets and now the lights without the power Flicker on into the night we go, we'll take the high My name is Brock Kirby and my great uncle was Michael Joseph Stewart Kirby. So the project or assignment was um, write about a hero. So some people would write about a comic or you know a celebrity or a close family member. So I chose a family member and um, with knowing a bit of his history and having medals um, from family members that kind of really sparked interest to find out the story behind those medals. So he was born in Ivano, Ontario, which is uh, 15 kilometers away from Maydock. It's a small hamlet known for its agriculture and resources and just great around great people. So he was born April 12, 1915 to Michael Kirby and Minnie Stewart. Stuart's mother passed away when he was 10 years old. Uh, she was pregnant at the time, and both of them passed away due to an illness. 
His father had to take care of the family during the depression, which was tough enough times in that era. The siblings probably had to pick up the extra slack around the house and probably uh, my uncle's, great uncle's sister, I imagine she had to play a mother role for the other siblings as well. This is actually the, the original homestead right here, which is still in existence and still also in the family name of the Kirby's. So this is the Ivano schoolhouse. Uh, this schoolhouse is located on Slab Street. Um, it's been converted a little bit, but um, in this photo you can see the exposed brick and the newer version has been slabbed over with wood, which really kind of takes away the originality of the, the old schoolhouse. The kids went to the school except for Pete. He was only here for a few months when it started. But you can see in this photo too, you know, um, he loved hockey, so um, I'm presuming it's one of these two lads here that are my great uncle Stuart there. And uh, yeah, they loved hockey and then throughout his whole life he, he played. You know, just around local ponds in winter time. Later on in school he had played for um, the Sterling High School team, which he was a great player. Um, and then later on, when he joined up for the Air Force, he was on the security guard hockey team, which were pretty good at the time, I guess. So they made it to the semifinals, and uh, there's some really great shots of them. Looks like a great group of fellows there. Hush little all and don't say a word. I'm gonna buy you a mockingbird. Yeah, he uh, left Maydock, Ontario to go work for a family hardware store, uh, Murrah. So he was a clerk and he worked there at the hardware store. And then uh, they had to leave mid-1937 due to the drought. There's no jobs and that's why he came back to Ontario for looking for work. Got hired on by uh, Connor and Sons um, hardware store. So after the war, Stewart was going to be actually part owner of the hardware store business. Uh, the contracts were all signed up and ready to go and just awaiting his uh, return back from active service. The owner of Connor and Sons actually had a, a plane, so he was able to go up uh, in the plane with the owner of the business and that's probably where he sparked his interest of uh, flying. So this is uh, the Connor and Sons uh, reference letter to recommend Stewart for his uh, attempt to get into the military. So uh, Mr. Stuart Kirby is in our employee since October 1937. His grandparents, his grandparents and parents are well known to the writer. Without any hesitation, we recommend Stuart for a commission in any branch of His Majesty's service. He is a very trustworthy, a capable, conscientious, willing worker. Confidently believing that Mr. Stuart Kirby would make good, I recommend him to your careful consideration. M.W. Connor and Son. So he joined the RCF uh, in Ottawa, December 19, 1940. They do a bunch of interview questions, scenarios, um, and eventually if you made it past certain stages, you do your hearing, your medical, and uh, I would imagine back in that time you'd do a reference check and make sure you know you're obviously a trustworthy subject to work for the military. This is where he had undergo training. Um, this is where he had learned to march, drill, and undergo great discipline. Um, also, his appearance is a big importance to the military, being clean-shaved and well-mannered and well-dressed. This is kind of what expectations are within the military. This is a photo of Stuart. I can visibly tell it's him. Um, it's hard to tell, but just with my years of uh, working on this project, I can tell it's him in Manning Depot, 1940.
it's basically like stepping back in time because all these buildings and uh, the airfield still intact. It's uh, quite amazing. They probably housed 800 people or men at one time there uh, during those eight to six week uh, training times. Stuart was in Trenton in the early 1940s. Uh, he was continuing his training. And then these photos, it actually shows uh, some of the hangars that are long gone now. But in the upper part of the photo, uh, the barracks are still there and the water tower, those are still there today. Mount Hope is uh, where you really started to get into the flying. Stewart's first plane he trained on was uh, the Fleet Finch. It was a biplane and it was used within the Commonwealth uh, training in World War II. It was one of the first planes that pilots would train on before moving on to the bigger and better planes. So at Camp Borden, he actually started flying the, the bigger plane. So at that time, it was the North American Yale, which is a similar plane to the North American Harvard, which he also flew. Um, so that's where he had eventually graduate before becoming a sergeant pilot. So he was the first sergeant pilot of Ivernal, Ontario. So that's pretty pretty significant for that time. Yeah, so, this, uh, so this is a pretty cool find here. Yeah, the actual plane my uncle flew. Uh, yeah, the North American Yale. And how do you know it was the same one? Uh, just from the serial number there. It matches up with uh, the log book and yeah, it's cool to see the paper version, but the actual real, the real thing. <laughs> That's quite impressive, you know, your uncle was sitting in that seat. <laughs> that actual, yeah, either the co-pilot or the pilot, no, it's, it's wild. This is a newspaper clipping of Stewart's graduating class. Uh, they all graduated in October 1941 where most of them would receive their wings and uh, they would proceed overseas shortly after. It must have gave Stuart some comfort knowing that he's going overseas with uh, some familiar faces and good buddies from Camp Borden. So they had a big uh, celebration and ceremony for uh, two local guys. Um, this is Jerry Keller. He was also in the Air Force as well as uh, Stuart, my great uncle. So this was actually taken in the armory in Madoc, which is still existing and still uh, used as a kind of a community hall. He'd uh, eventually head to Halifax, leaving from Ivanhoe, making his way through either Ottawa or Toronto or going upwards through, you know, the whole system, the lines uh, for trains. This photo is a, a group photo of the fellow guys that are going overseas, but they uh, had a 30 minute stop in Moncton, New Brunswick. And this is where you can see in their eyes they're enjoying the last bit of home before going overseas. You know, they're cherishing every moment of home before going over. And the unfortunate aspect is some of these guys would not make it home. This is a letter addressed uh, to my grandfather, John Kirby. Um, Stuart was brothers with my grandfather, John. November 14th, 1941, still having a good time, not, not doing, doing much. much. Kitch King did and I billeted in a fine room in a private hotel. Bath, water, and fireplace. A grand life for sure. The weather here is misty and foggy, and everything is still green and pretty. Here are a few snapshots of England. Best wishes, Stu. You really uh, had a good time. Got to see, you know, country a lot more than I've no Ontario or Maydock, so yeah, this was a 
kind of a big thing for these guys. I mean, getting away from their small towns and exploring the world and doing bigger and better things. This is uh, Westminster. Uh, this is a cathedral that Stuart attended, and he was here a couple of times, or showcased this through uh, some postcards. He uh, did some praying here and attended some masses. Religion was a big portion of his uh, life. You know, spent many times uh, at the Roman Catholic uh, church in Stirling, and before heading overseas, he spent some time there too. So he had started off training in uh, the Oxfords, Airspeed Oxfords. They're a wider plane, they're a bigger plane compared to the Harvard, the Yale, and uh, the Fleet Finch especially. Uh, so that was a starter point for getting into the bombing portion of flying. This is a photograph of another training facility uh, utilized during World War II. Uh, Stuart was here at Mount Farms flying Wellingtons. Um, this is where he get the first taste of uh, this great plane. He was a real heavy hitter in the war and uh, this was used before the Lancaster. So uh, this was the major bomber portion of the Commonwealth uh, for the British. This plane was built in the early 1930s, so you know, it's almost, you know, old, too old to be fighting in this war, but still effective to be utilized in the war. This is Stuart with Hal Graham. He was a good friend of Stuart and also another Canadian. These two were flying uh, a Wellington bomber to uh, Egypt. This is where they get their real taste of combat experience during the Second World War. So at first they kind of got there, and then it's a little bit of a kind of, you know, kind of relaxed time before, yeah, their downtime before they get into it heavily. He went on a horseback tour uh, to the, the, the ruins and the pyramids. They're wearing kind of a tan um, summer year, you know, probably to help with the sun because it'd be pretty hot compared to Canadian weather. You can see the tents in the background, the dirt, the sand, the dust. You got everything. The service guides to Cairo and it says, uh, Sergeant Kirby, May 27, 1942, Cairo, Egypt. That's a pretty neat piece. Well, these were some of his photos that he actually uh, took outside the plane. You can see the Nile River in Egypt. There's a shot of his uh, Wellington right here of the, the pyramids. Yeah, he, he got some good shots. This is a pretty cool uh, article um, it's about the Canadians in the, the Middle East. Here's a group of the guys there, and there's Stuart there in the photo. This is uh, Sergeant Cooper. He was another Canadian pilot. Uh, he was actually from the Hamilton area. He and Stuart were on a night operation um, bombing the Germans and the Italians in the Middle East. He was co-pilot for a while before uh, before becoming a first pilot or leading aircraft pilot.
November 16th, 1942. Dear Dad and all, I have somebody's prayers to thank and the Almighty that I'm now able to be writing you as we had a narrow escape last Friday night the 13th. We were returning from one of our raids in the early morn. It was very dark out when the propeller on one of the motors flew off. And of course that motor was then useless. So we flew along for about an hour on the one but kept losing altitude. When the clock showed a thousand feet, I knew we weren't gonna reach base and neither could we bail out. So we prepared for the worst and I must say, I really prayed and darn hard. At 600 feet, I put on a bottom light and what a shock to see that we were only six feet from the ground. So one pull on the stick, one terrible crash, dust, glass, etc. flying around, a small fire in one motor. Thank God all six of us were unscratched. It's one of those lucky blessings that seldom happen. And although the kite will never fly again, we are all safe and back. It was my first accident in flying. We knew we were out in the desert, so slept on the ground near the plane till dawn and nearly froze. Then we started walking, each a bottle of water and some tablets. There was no sign of life, nothing but sand and rock and hills and an odd enemy truck. Had it been two weeks sooner, we would have been well behind the enemy line. As it was, we had the experience of coming through the main battleground of what you've read of our great victory here in Egypt. About noon, we came across an old Italian truck, gave it a crank, and away it went. Boy, what a thrill. So we boarded it and started north for the coast. You have no idea of the defeat Jerry took, as the desert is full of trucks and lorries, tanks, guns, stores, and a horrible number of graves. We gathered lots of booty, guns, knives, letters, cards, hats, etc. And you should have seen our officers the next night when we drove in, in our Italian lorry, with our souvenirs. Unshaven, dirty, and nothing to eat for 48 hours, but darn glad to be back. Well, I'm okay, feel fine, and I hope to be done soon. So all my love and best wishes. Stuart. So when he crashed in the Middle East, he actually uh, received a, a word. It was called the flying boot. It's uh, for anyone that crashes in the water or bails and survives or anyone who crashed beyond enemy lines. So this was just kind of like a, a word that was kind of amongst you know, the men in the Middle East. So he did 37 operations all in total in the Middle East and then uh, so I think that was close enough for his almost tour. Right. And then they sent him to England after, I, I want to say after that big significant event in the Middle East. And uh, it's kind of like, you know, I mean, we appreciate what you did. And uh, you know I mean? It's almost like, you know, your safe belt to the rest of the war. It's uh, kind of like a little, part of his logbook it talks about his flight time and uh, uh, so this is like he just got sent from the Middle East to uh, England uh, this is him doing his instructor course off from Wellsbourne, England. Uh, that was one of the training bases there where he was training Canadian pilots and also other Commonwealth uh, airmen. Um, so they were on a training exercise and uh, so at 0100 hours uh, the plane Wellington Bomber HE-218 suffered uh, engine failure and the result of that was uh, they couldn't make it back to base and they couldn't land in a safe area. They pancaked into a forest area. One evening there was a heavy thump when he realized the plane has come down. We opened up the door and could see the whole woods was on fire. I and others rushed to the site and see if we could give any assistance but all the crew has been killed. The Wellington has hit the top of the trees and pancaked. It also crashed very close to my parents' cottage. Kerosene was running like a river. This was 
an all-Canadian crew that was killed in this plane crash. Um, we had one guy from Quebec, one guy from Ontario, one from Vancouver, and one from Edmonton. There's so much that goes on in your mind that, you know, what was happening in that plane? And, uh, did he freeze? Did he... Um, were they crying? Were they screaming? Were they... You know, it's, it's tough to think. And you, don't really, and you kind of don't want to think. No, 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 no. <laughs> They're all buried at Stratford on Avon, England, uh, which is a cemetery there. So that's my ultimate bucket list to go see his grave and possibly find where he actually crashed. There's a grave marker, which is kind of unusual. There's uh, some multiple mistakes on it. Um, so the gravestone is actually his parents, so Michael and Minnie um, Kirby. That was his parents. Um, but he's also featured on that headstone. Um, it says Stuart Kirby killed in action or killed in England. Um, but the weird part about it, the etching on it, it was 1914, but he was born in 1915, so it was an error but also the fact that it says he was killed in 1942. He had a major flying accident, so maybe they presumed that he was dead, but he was killed in 43. So there is an error on that headstone. He has a, such a unique story, and I just kind of really wanted to uncover the full truth. You know, I heard so many different stories, and he's such a, you know, unknown hero and this is something I really wanted to portray and get his true story out and share it alone with my family but people who are have the same common interests as myself you know that really um, want to honor these brave heroes and get their stories out I keep on saying I mean I I think I've ran out my resources and next thing you know something pops up and you know, I got a new lead or I got a new uh, direction to go by and I want to say I, I'm done, but I'm not. I want to put a, a final stamp on this, but it's kind of, kind of one of those things that keeps on going. And I don't know what lead will end me or when I'm going to finish this project, but hopefully I could put a final stamp on it one of these days. But I love this uh, this drive and the search for more information and connections and documentation and photos.